action as change in collective groups, I guess. There you go. Thank you. Can you all hear me well? I guess so. I can hear myself. I'll try to be on time. All right, so I'm going to tell you this is a little bit modified title. I thought about it more, and I think it sounds better like this. Uh, about the effect of the interaction, interaction network and the kind of information that you're exchanging on the collective behavior. This work I mainly did with Ali, uh, a good friend in Turkey, and his student Ege, who's a great student. They're both at Ankara, where I'm just coming from right now. And I'm uh, based in Chicago usually, but I'm also affiliated to a bunch of places. I'm kind of delocalized, so I belong to everywhere and nowhere. So the motivation for this uh, is what I'm going to tell you about now. Um, I'm going to talk about a very specific um, model and some very fresh results, but I also want to always make a connection to some kind of broader motivation of the, of the questions that I want to, I think, that we can address with this kind of models. Um, and the broader question is how does self-organization in, uh, in this case, some kind of dynamical consensus, depend on the interaction network, who's talking to whom, and in this specific place, the kind of information exchange, which could be either position information or velocity heading information in the term of a physicist, but that really means if information on where we are or where we're going, right? So it's broader than that. And I, I feel that this could be, have a very broad kind of perspective for different systems. Of course, there are the physical systems, but there's biological processes. I point out that this space in which we're moving, we self-organize, this could be an abstract space, or it'd be a configuration space, behavioral space, or something like that. So it could be broader than just physical collective motion, but also collective behavior in general, um, animal groups, social systems, and storm robotics. And this points to a, a, a thread that has been a little bit part of this conference regarding universality in these kinds of systems. Um, as a physicist, I feel that it's really interesting to look for new kinds of universalities in these systems. Um, I don't want to sound arrogant. I think for, we all agree that for many here, the way the physicists look at these problems seems arrogant already. But I also want to point out to my physicist colleagues and friends that I'm not telling them what they should be doing. Um, I've, we've seen very beautiful talks about uh, how you can extend statistical mechanics and other fields into the area of, for example, active matter. Um, and you can look at all kinds of extensions of the universality that we're used to as physicists into those fields. But I do believe that if we're really talking about collective behavior, we should try to find new ways of, of expressing universality. And it is frustrating because we can barely use some of the tools that we're used to, which are beautiful. And uh, instead, we have to think and take some baby steps. Um, but of course, I'm not telling my physicist colleagues what they should be doing. I just would encourage people, I wish more people would try to look toward these kind of other universality concepts. However, having said that, what I'm going to look at are very specific cases, a very specific model, which I wish and I hope that in the future, with a lot of more work, we can show have some kind of universal behavior. Um, before I do that, though, I'm going to tell you about three, three very briefly, I really don't have much time, um, other projects I've been working on, which kind of go in the same direction. One is a fascination I have on the dynamics of modular hierarchical structures. You see modular hierarchical structures, meaning modules that organize into modules, that organize into modules all over nature. It seems to be a very universal principle. And if we would want to start understanding what that means, we can look at modular hierarchical networks, which is a work that I did with uh, Benjamin Meyer, his stu the student of Dirk Brockman and Dirk, who's, who are in Berlin. Uh, in which we can try to see, like, if we go from a disconnected, extremely modular network to a random network, what kind of processes, what kind of benefits it has or disadvantages it has for the kind of processes that you could expect to have there. Uh, what we found, and I really don't have much time, but is that there's some kind of optimal point of intermediate modularity, modular hierarchical structure or hierarchical modularity, in which you have some optimal diffusion and optimal search processes, and that this relates to the small world phenomenon. On the other side, Again, a different problem. Um, we were looking um, some years ago to what happens with opinion formation dynamics. This was related to the first talk to some extent, um, in which you can uh, have a network where you have different opinions, say uh, green and, and red here. The connections tell you to what extent people are sharing those opinions. And what we showed in this work some years ago was that um, if you uh, allow the rewiring to happen in a such a way that people tend to be with those that agree with them, and you impose the kind of interactions that you expect to find online, you have much more easier the fragmentation of the network into one network that thinks red, one network that thinks green, and that don't talk to each other. 
We also understood the mechanism for that. This has had a second life because, of course, uh, today you understand these things as, as uh, filter bubbles, and you have the emergence of Post News and the emergence of uh, Donald Trump, etc. So with that, you got, uh, we got a lot of interest in that. I got a lot of interest in that, and now I'm working with some Chilean people, which is my original country, uh, to analyze data and try to see this kind of dynamics. Oh, and this comes from a different from a different uh, talk with, to just show that there was a lot of interest, there was a lot of uh, press, because really uh, there's some kind of intuition of universal behavior that people don't even know how to think about in this specific system, but I think we can contribute something from the perspective of a physicist. And the third thing I'm gonna mention is a project I'm, I'm doing with people in, in China, uh, Professor Han and Yating Shang, who, Sheng, who uh, did these experiments actually, I need to start the second one, and it's uh, applic an application of the model that I'm gonna tell you in a, in a minute about, in which we use it to control groups of, of robots uh, that are, in this particular case, it's a quite simple setup, so it's, they're extremely noisy, but despite that, and there's time lags, there are all kinds of issues, but despite that, they managed to organize in some kind of collective dynamics. All right, <clears throat> the other thing I'll tell you before I really go into matter, is uh, the experimental insights of this thought of what is the difference between having different communication networks, having different kinds of interactions, uh, information exchange, and a lot of it comes from uh, the original insights, uh, some a priori, some a posteriori, to be honest, come from uh, work of Ian Cousins' lab, and uh, this is work uh, we were actually uh, worked on together, um, or this paper that I think did a lot of things, but one of the things that we did that was, I find it quite interesting, was that when you look at the actual data of two fish in one given species, um, and you try to see how one fish is reacting to the other, you could have two hypotheses, right? You can even just think that they're trying to stay uh, close to each other in some kind of distance uh, way, or that they're trying to align a la Vickshek model. Right? And what you see in this plot, I don't have much time to explain it either, but you can kind of intuit here that in the, the left-right distance, with respect to the turning force, the turning social force, I would call it, the tendency to turn is what is critical. So if you're too far to the right, you're turning right, which is the red color heat map, and if you're too far to the left, you're turning left. But the other axis, this y-axis, is telling you the relative angle. So in fact, if you're too far to the right and, you're, and the neighbor is, I mean, if the neighbor is too far to the right and is turning right or is turning left, in fact, you kind of react similarly. And this, what it's showing you is that for this particular case, at least, um, it, the signal for the uh, position-based interaction, the exchange of information in the position is much more strong than the signal for the alignment-based interaction, the exchange of information and the velocity. Another inspiration, this happened after we finished our project with, with Ian, but it's related to, th to things we've been talking for some time. Um, they did this beautiful experiment in which they could extract with a lot of work uh, the interaction, actual interaction network between a group of fish, and they showed that the interaction network could have effects on the collective dynamics and that it was non-trivial. And that's all I, I need to say about that as, as uh, experimental insights for this problem. All right. So um, sharing velocities of, positions to, uh, velocities of positions to achieve collective motion. I'm going to look at these two aspects. How does it, collective motion uh, depend on what information you share, velocity of positions, and the network. So let's first start by velocities or positions. Um, I'm almost embarrassed to show this uh, transparency because we've been talking about the Vichyk model for the whole conference, but I just want to highlight that's a simulation I did ages ago. Uh, there was, this is a figure from the original paper of 95, uh, in which you see that an order parameter that will be equal to one if they're aligned and zero if they're disordered, goes down to zero as the noise increases, and this looks very much, or it looked originally as a second order phase transition, it turned out to be a weak, uh, very small first order transition, and there's a whole lot of people here who worked a lot, and, and it's really interesting how they managed to figure this, this whole puzzle out. Um, but what I will tell you a little bit more about, um, well, so the first thing I want to mention is that this is an explicit alignment model exclusively. So you really don't exchange any information on where you are. You do select the ones that are close to you, but that, I would argue, is more the protocol of the interaction network in this particular case. You're really only connecting to the velocity of your neighbors. So I'll introduce to you here an uh, active elastic model that, w that we did some years ago. Um, um, and uh, the rest of the talk has to do with how this behaves different than the Vichyk, traditional Vichyk model. So I'll spend a couple of minutes just explaining you what this is. 
I would say it's a very intuitive uh, uh, model, sorry. Um, it was inspired a little bit on robot motion, so these are like little robots, you can think on little wheels. And uh, what you do is that you just put these agents that tend to move forward, connect them with a certain springs. The springs have a natural length, so they can have a linear attraction repulsion uh, dynamics. And you compute the elastic forces over this uh, subject, for example. And then, once you have these elastic forces, by measuring center to center the distances, you um, grab those forces and project them on the direction of motion and you add that to the self-propulsion force or velocity in this case because it's overdamped in, in that sense, at least in first equations, or you uh, project them perpendicular to the direction of motion and, sorry, you project them perpendicular to the direction of motion and that gives you the uh, angular rotational speed. So mechanically, this is just the same as pulling these uh, robots from the nose. Um, you, you, you add this component to the velocity, to the speed, you turn with this rate, but it is not exactly a mechanical analogy because then we measure the distance center to center to analyze the elastic forces. We do that explicitly to be at the opposite limit of the Wigchick model, so that there's no influence between the orientation and the elastic forces that these things are, are feeling. I may mention that there was a parallel uh, model that was developed uh, originally also by uh, in a Schabo paper, also by Tamas Wigchick's group, and then it was used by Christina Marchetti in some interesting uh, active jamming uh, analysis that was very similar to this one. It's also based in position, but in that case, agents are allowed to move sideways because they're thinking more microscopic cells or something that can be pushed uh, diagonally, and then the direction of motion relaxes into that direction. All right, so what does this model do? Uh, this are results from a little time ago already. Um, you, we, we wire, as I just told you, I'm not showing you the springs, but we wire these systems uh, to their nearest neighbors in this case. Here we throw them randomly in a certain shape that we chose to be a square with two, two, two holes. Um, and then after we throw them randomly in that region, we wire them locally in an interaction region that is you know, very small. I can't really keep my pulse steady enough to show you about what it is, but it's something like this. And you just... Um, uh, connect them through the springs. You choose the natural length such that the initial random position is exactly their natural length. So they end up being completely relaxed initially. They're just pointing in different directions. And the question is, can this manage to go in one direction or uh, rotate? So we find, we found numerically that you could get into this rotational or translational state. It doesn't really depend on the crystalline structure. This is color by angle. This isn't. The transition is very similar to the Wigchuk one, but here is a stronger first order transition, so you really have a bistable region here. Uh, that's not the focus of what I'm talking about now, so I'm not giving much information. Uh, but it is, it was surprisingly, to some extent, a symmetry breaking transition because it's not clear where these things, while they're sharing information on their positions, could agree on some specific direction of motion without having a leader pulling them or something like that. Right? But it ended up happening. So after they published this in 2013, I mean, when we published this in 2013, we wanted to understand the mechanism, and I'll also spend a minute because I do think that there's some universality in this mechanism, or at least I hope, and I think that uh, if I want to make a grand claim, it could be a mechanism for self-organization that people hadn't really considered before. Um, so the mechanism is that like an all active matter system or active system, you're injecting energy at the, at, the, at the smallest scale. So those are, if you think of this thing as a bunch of agents connected by springs, it's a little bit like an elastic membrane, right? So that means that you're injecting uh, energy at the smallest scales, that is, as the, as the higher energy modes, right? Because these things for the smaller scales it mean higher oscillations, it's typically higher energy modes. And if you plot the energy that each one of these modes have, like from bottom to top here, uh, over time in a simulation like this one, similar, not exactly this one, um, you see that the higher energy modes st starts to decay, right? And it has a lot of persistencies and weed behavior. I think this could be done better with a different approach, but this is what we got, and I think it proves the point. Well, you do see that there's a lot of persistence of some of these lower energy modes that can be a breathing mode or something like that that remains here. And eventually it reaches all out of this scale of this thing because it's a zero mode, which is a translational mode. So if you think of it in these terms, what needs to happen is that on one side you need to have a certain decay of higher energy mode, but you also have to have 
that the local coupling of the way you're injecting energy at the smallest scale has to not go against this, this the decay of higher energy modes. So you, you don't want to be repopulating these higher energy modes uh, all the time because you're pointing in all kinds of directions that stretch the system in modes that are high and that cannot ever dissipate. Right? So I think that this, while it's a simple idea, it gives me a lot of intuition and I really like uh, thinking you know, intuitively as a physicist and it goes to a very uh, strong um, you know, standard uh, dynamics in, in physical system which is just os general oscillations and I like the, as the analogy with a guitar string just to have this in mind. Right? So when you plug a guitar locally you're exciting all kinds of modes, these propagates, they do all kinds of messy stuff but eventually you hear the fundamental note. Eventually the string is oscillating collectively. right? We never think in physics, at least when we are taught this, as this as a self-organizing mechanism. But deep inside it is, I would argue. Right? You're going from some kind of local disordered excitations into some kind of collective dynamics. Right? So now if you add self-propulsion locally, then you, it just happens to be that you have to couple the way that that self-propulsion is, is uh, connected to the uh, elastic forces and you will get some kind of criterion for self-organization. So let me give you the last part of the components and then I get to the results which are actually just like one slide. So it's really, it's the kicker of this analysis. Um, what we did now is that since we have this membrane, we can decide to actually put these springs in different ways. And we tried two different ways to do it. Instead of connecting nearest neighbors as we were doing before, and in this case we took a square lattice but it doesn't matter, um, we actually added some random connections that we're connecting long distance, okay? with the same uh, active elastic model, the same rules that I told you about. But you can do random in different ways in a network, so we chose to do random in two different ways. One is the Erdos-Reni random graph, which just takes a constant probability of any kind of two connections, and the other one is a scale-free uh, graph in which you have uh, some nodes that have a lot of connections and many nodes that have only few connections. Okay? And then we could vary this the factor P going from nearest neighbors to either the Erdos-Reni graph or to the scale-free network graph. Right? Um, when you look at the number of uh, the distribution of uh, number of agents that have a certain number of connections per agent, the Erdos-Reni ones give you a Poisson distribution. This is the ideal. This the points are what we're actually simulating in the finite system that we have, and the random graph, uh, sorry, the scale-free gives you a power law distribution. So results. When you start adding random connections, long distance connections, and you're in the Victric model, I go back to the Victric model protocol, you see what you would expect. So you start from nearest neighbor connections, you have the transition a la Victric model, it's a relatively small system, so it's not too sharp, but then as you go to the fully random network, you're adding long distance connections. When you add long distance connections, you expect to have some kind of small world effect. The Victric model is nothing more than really some kind of uh, delocalized, or I mean decentralized consensus problem. So you will get this limit when you get to a fully random network. And it doesn't matter if you do that with an Erdos Reni random network or with a scale free random network. So, this is the main result. What I'm showing you now here is that when you do this with our model in which you don't exchange velocity, so therefore you're not associated directly to a um, consensus problem, but more to a complicated thing that I, would, that I made an analogy to elasticity with. Uh, you get a very uh, striking effect that when you go to an Erdos Reni random network, you actually go. Uh, towards also a, a slightly better performance, meaning you have a better resilience to noise, your critical noise moves to the right. However, when you go to a very free random network, your system becomes very, very dis unstable. Right? So you actually your critical noise goes drastically down. And I hope, like, uh, in one minute, I can tell you what the mechanism is. These results, we really just got them last week, so I don't have a full demonstration, but I think that the intuition that I created till now should allow you to understand why this is not so surprising. Because if I now just grab the same data that was simulated and put it in a graph, right, and these graphs are they're called force director graphs, so somehow they push the uh, nodes with less uh, connections towards the edges, um, you see that the one that gives you intermediate resistance to noise is a proximity graph. It organized like this in this case, right? Then the erdos reni graph gives you something very entangled. So you can imagine that the collective modes will be somehow uh, different, but they will have some similarity to the just sheet. However, the scale-free graph has a bunch of nodes that only have two connections. We limited it to two connections because the one connection nodes didn't make much sense in our model. Um, and these actually have a lot of low energy 
high frequency excitations, right? So you're at a low energy, you easily can excite modes all around this, this thing, which will not self-organize because they're not coherent. They don't have large scales. They're actually acting only very locally. So in some ways, that's enough to understand the model, I think, and I hope that in the near future we'll be able to uh, actually do, again, the graphs of how the uh, modes decay and understand this problem fully. And with that, I finish, and I would be happy to take some questions. Thank you very much, Christian. Are there any questions?